Week nine college football picks against the spread. And we got games that have major playoff implications this weekend. We got a battle between the top two teams in the Big Ten in Eugene. We got a battle between the top two teams in the SEC down in Baton Rouge. Now, having a tie amongst the Big Ten or the ACC or even the SEC, is it possible? Yes. Is it going to result in chaos? Absolutely. So the playoff committee is going to want a clearer picture. Uh, but let's get to it. You guys, make sure that you guys like, subscribe, tell a friend about The Unafraid Show, and most importantly, share. I'm going to give you a second. Go down, mash the button, thumbs up. And if you're watching on Twitter, go on Twitter and go to the YouTube feed. Leave a comment and everything in between because the show is growing thanks to you guys. And I'm telling you, I appreciate it. And the more the show grows, the more dope content we're going to be able to bring for you. Let's get into it. First game up. Illinois at Oregon. Oregon's favored in this game by 21 and a half points. Now, it took 12 years since the last time that my Oregon Ducks were the AP number one team in the country, and that was under Chip Kelly. And to do it again under Dan Lanning, oh, oh, it's a very special moment. And I don't love that it had to go through a Texas loss because it should have been the last week after the Ohio State game. So now, Oregon, I'm telling you right now, they're going to need to go out and defend a ranking that journalists actually back them into instead of putting them there where they rightfully belong. And I'm not trying to be greedy in this situation, but Heisman trophies and national championships are things that turn you into a blue blood. Oregon already has one national championship, and this is an opportunity for Dylan Gabriel to cement himself in that Heisman conversation with Cam Ward and uh, Ashton Ginty, which are the number one and number two guys in the Heisman Trophy race right now. So Gabriel's going to need to take on a tough Illinois defense because this defense is tough. They have absolutely shut down opponents and done a really good job. And Brett Bielema has been a uh, after – his initial year blaming the players. He has gotten the players in there that he wants, and he is coaching them up. So he deserves a big hand clap there. And that means that Dylan Gabriel is going to have to outshine a quarterback on the other side that's been the most improved quarterback in all of college football, and that's in Luke Altmaier because his glow up has been ridiculous. And he has 15 touchdowns to only one interception. And the real catalyst of this Illinois offense is the same as any other Brett Bielema coach team. It is the running game. Now, in Illinois' six wins this year, they averaged 165 yards on four and a half yards per carry on the ground. And in their one loss, that Penn State game, Penn State held them to 34 yards on 32 attempts. Now, I like Oregon's chances in this game, not only to win, but to cover if they can force Luke Altmaier to be the one to beat them. But if that Illinois running game, if it gets going, it is going to limit Oregon's offensive possessions and make this a very, very close game, which obviously Oregon Duck fans have no appetite for at this point in time. Now, I know that 21 and a half is a very large spread between two teams that only have one combined loss. But Oregon's offense isn't slowing down for anybody. If it didn't slow down for Ohio State, the best defense in the country, it certainly won't be slowing down for Illinois. So this spread just comes about whether Illinois can actually keep up offensively. Now, Illinois, though, to their credit, is having an impressive year on offense. They're in the top 25 for the fifth consecutive week for a reason. If you follow me, you know how impressed I've been with the growth of Luke Altmaier. Now, he came into the season with 16 touchdown passes and 13 interceptions. And to be this year, 15 to 1, right, that is absolutely incredible. And he's going to need to be the best version of himself because Oregon is going to load up to stop that running game and then the rely on their cornerbacks like Muhammad and the rest of the crew in the back end to be able to stop those Illinois wide receivers. Because I believe that the Ducks are going to sell out the same way that Penn State did. Shut down the running game and make Altmaier beat them. Because as good as Altmaier has been, look at the difference between the six games and they've won and what they've lost. It is all about this running game. And I like Luke Altmaier, but not enough to think that he can cover on his own if the Ducks shut down that running game. So give me the Ducks minus 21 and a half. We got Missouri at Alabama, minus 14 and a half. Oh, what's up, Alabama? 
Oh, you just took a loss at Tennessee. You've already lost to Vanderbilt and your coach is under fire. Your players, people are questioning the discipline going on down there in Tuscaloosa. This is a must win. Now, the AP poll has Alabama at number 15, inexplicably to me. And I wonder where the college football playoff committee would seat them. But I'm telling you, they lose this Missouri game and it is over. It is 100% over for them in the college football playoffs this season. And you know what else that means? That means that Kalen DeBoer, oh, Lord, if he's eliminated from the college football playoff by week nine, oh, if that happens, oh, legend and all the rest of the crazies that call into the Paul Feinbaum show, they are going to go nuts on Monday. Uh, But over on the Missouri side, Brady Cook is hurt. He went to the hospital last game to get some testing done and came back, but they won the football game. But the question is, is he hurt or is he injured? And that's the big question heading into what is a must win for both teams when it comes to their college football playoff hopes. And I know that at this point in time, every game is a must win for Alabama. Actually, all the time because it's Alabama. But back to Brady Cook for a second. This dude went to go get an MRI last week on his ankle and then led the game-winning drive against Auburn. The dude is a special player. And he definitely gives Missouri the best chance to win. But their backup, Drew Pine, he ain't no stranger to big games himself. Because Pine played against Cincinnati the year that they went to the college football playoff. And the dude won eight games as a starter at Notre Dame back in 2022. But the question is, can he handle this Alabama defense? All right, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Of course he can, because everybody can. Because everybody is handling this Alabama defense right now. Kane Womack's unit, his defense over at Bama is giving up 31 points per game over their last four games, and they've given up 15 touchdowns over that span. Now, to put that into context, that's more touchdowns than they surrendered in the last four games than they surrendered through the first seven games of both 2022 and 2023. But their quarterback, Jalen Miro, the dude is still dangerous. He's not playing with a whole bunch of confidence right now, but it's really going to be up to him to prove that last week's game against Tennessee was an anomaly and an outlier for him. So he's going to have to play with a confidence that he hasn't been playing with recently. Now, otherwise, if he doesn't play well, things are going to get ugly for this brand new staff over in Tuscaloosa. This game also is going to hinge on Missouri's offensive line, who's been solid. And Alabama is on one of their worst stretches on the defensive side in modern memory. Now, their head coach over at Bama, Kalen DeBoer, he probably wishes it was as simple as their defensive coordinator, Kane Warmack, copying Jay Bateman and Jordan Peterson's game plan from Texas A&M's 41-10 win over Missouri. But for Alabama, it feels like it's less of a scheme issue and more of a discipline issue at this point in time. Now, I'm not sure if Alabama's issues get solved this week, no matter who Missouri has at their quarterback, whether it's Drew Pine or Brady Cook. So give me the Tigers plus 14 and a half. This feels like an absolute layup. Next up, Texas A&M minus two and a half at LSU. Now, Texas A&M's head coach, Mike Elko, when he came over from Duke, that was a great hire. Now, it was strange at the time for A&M to go and get an assistant that they had already had on staff a while ago and bring him back to College Station. But the Aggies are on the verge of being 5-0 in SEC play. And if they beat LSU, it will only be the fourth time that the Aggies have ever had five or more wins in SEC play. And Mike Elko? Now, granted, he would not have been the head coach for all of them. But uh, he would have been on the staff for three of them. Now, don't sleep on this LSU team, though, because this feels like an early college football playoff game to me. LSU is 6-1 and one after an early loss to USC, which looks bad right now. And Texas A&M is in the same boat after dropping their opener to Notre Dame. But at least Notre Dame is ranked pretty highly. So this game is crucially important. And this game is in Baton Rouge, a place where Texas A&M is 0-6 since their last win in 1994. You got to respect, though, the job that Brian Kelly, LSU's head coach, has done in rebounding from that early loss to USC. His table-pounding tantrum, like, this team, um, it must have worked. It must have made a difference because his offense is cooking. And aside from that South Carolina game, which they they probably should have lost because – 
that was a bad call away from uh, them losing that game. But their defense is giving up eight less points per game than they did in 2023. Now, their schedule, it's been light since that USC game. But it all changes on Saturday. And by the end of this game, we're going to know who's the real deal. Because this Aggies defense has been stingy. But if there's one offense that can figure them out, it might be the LSU Tigers. Because all year long, the Tigers have taken what the defense has given them. And their quarterback, Garrett Nussmeyer, has been efficient. He's been pretty damn good. So, mm, that's something to be excited about. I'm excited to see Caden Durham, their superstar freshman running back over at LSU. Because the kid is special. And this is a grittier LSU team than people are willing to admit. And whether that's because the loss to USC or the defensive issues from previous years, I don't know what the reason is that they want to give them credit. All I know is that Baton Rouge, it is a tough environment to win. And I know that the Texas A&M Aggies are like, listen, Kyle, Kyle Field is the best place. But I'm just saying, Um, which is why. The Aggies haven't won in Baton Rouge in 30 years. And I know that they haven't played a lot, but these are the facts. Now, I don't think that this streak ends this year. Give me LSU minus two and a half. We got Penn State minus six and a half at Wisconsin. Camp Randall Stadium is one of the best places in college football. I got a chance to play there. Their fans, when they do jump around, they do the wave, they do it vertical, they do it horizontal, they reverse it, they do everything. Those fans at Camp Randall are dope. And you have to think that Penn State is having a very fun season between their electric home games and getting to visit USC and Wisconsin. Now, it might not be a bad thing that USC scared Penn State two weeks ago because otherwise they might have spent the bye week looking past Wisconsin to next week's home game against Ohio State. But that may have been a wake-up call for them. But after giving up an uncharacteristic five explosive plays combined for 191 yards in Los Angeles, the Nittany Lions likely used the bye week to refocus on offense and on defense and draw a big target on the Badgers' backs. Now, on the Wisconsin side, how many of y'all thought that this team was dead at the moment that they lost Tyler Van Dyke for the season and they got beat up by Alabama? Be honest, because a lot of us did. Because one of the biggest surprises of the year has been their backup, Brayden Locks, last three games. He's 3-0, seven combined passing and rushing touchdowns, and he's looked fairly competent throwing the football. Now, competent is exactly what Drew Aller hopes to get back to after his first multiple interception game of his career against USC. I am convinced, though, that the Nittany Lions defense is going to get back to form. They are going to be able to shut Wisconsin down. But the question is going to be about these quarterbacks. Who is going to play better, uh, Braden Locke or Drew Aller? And everybody knows. I, I think that, that Drew Aller is a cool quarterback. But he's not special. Well, he hasn't shown himself to be special so far. But I got to give a big shout out to Penn State tight end, Ty Walker. The dude is absolutely electric. He runs touchdown passes. He catches touchdown passes. He is absolutely fantastic. And he's been a special piece to this Penn State offense and really the engine that makes this offense go. Now, I am taking James Franklin and his boys over there, the Nittany Lions, by a touchdown to set up a massive top five matchup with Ohio State on November 2nd. Oklahoma plus 20 and a half at Ole Miss. Now, the Sooners wanted change, and they got change. It wasn't the kind of change that they were anticipating because after Dylan Gabriel moved on and they kind of pushed him out the door at quarterback over to Oregon, the hype behind their quarterback, Jackson Arnold, oh, it was immense. They were like, oh, he's going to be better and all this stuff. Well, just after a few games of struggling offensively, they then moved to their backup Michael Hawkins, true freshman. And then Brett Venables made the statement that he doesn't believe in firing assistants during the season. One game later, what happened? Offensive coordinator Steph Luttrell, dude is gone, fired. And the Sooners are back to Jackson Arnold at quarterback. Now, could it be that the Oklahoma, that they need to upset Ole Miss on the road? I mean, it doesn't have to be. It just has to be the catalyst that keeps the game within three scores. Now, Ole Miss has had two weeks to prepare for this game and to try to figure out what happened to their offense that took it from a minimum of 8.2 yards per offensive play over their first four games against (coughs) not very good competition 
to three straight games of a maximum of 6.3 yards per play. Now, Oklahoma's offense might be even more disjointed than Lane Kiffin's, but they still play solid defense. And because of that, I like this game to stay within that 20 points. So give me Oklahoma plus 20 and a half. Now, the game that I would absolutely stay away from is Indiana minus six and a half at home against Washington. Because Kurt Singetti, Indiana's head coach, is running away with the coach of the year right now. And after a 49-point win over Nebraska, it might be super tempting to put your kid's college fund on the Hoosiers to cover the six and a half over Washington. But hold up on that. Indiana is a very good defense. Now, they don't get enough credit for that. But we don't know how much of this offense is Kurt Singetti and how much it has to do with their quarterback, Curtis Roick, who actually had surgery on his thumb this week. Now, Washington might be looking extra human away from their home stadium this year, but they also had two weeks to prepare for this game, and I would not be surprised if they kept it closer than the one touchdown spread, but I'm not putting my money on it, and neither should you. Now we got Notre Dame at Navy. If at any point during Notre Dame's 49-3 win over Navy to start the 2023 season, if I would have told you that in the 14 months between then and now, that this rematch would be must-watch television, then you would have had me committed. You would have said, George, you are absolutely crazy. This will never be a top 25 game. (laughs) But here we are. And a game where that has major playoff implications. This game is so big that they even got my guy Greg McElroy doing the call on the game at MetLife Stadium this Saturday. Now you got Brian Newberry who took a loss at Army to end the season last year and keep Navy from being bowl eligible. And the man hasn't lost since. Navy is 6-0 and has the number four scoring offense in the country behind option superstar quarterback Blake Horvath. And I bet you never thought that you'd hear the name Colin Kaepernick and the U.S. Naval Academy in the same sentence. But Blake Horvath became the only the second quarterback in college history to have two touchdown passes, four rushing touchdowns, and 200 rushing yards in a single game when he tore apart Memphis earlier this year. Now, you can't really prepare for an offense like this because nobody really runs it, and it is non-traditional. So Notre Dame is going to have to be efficient and deadly on the offensive side, something that they have not been at all when it comes to getting an early lead and have to force Navy into situations where they have to pass the football. And that's something that Notre Dame, even though their offense has not been explosive, that they've been able to do well recently because Riley Leonard, even though he's not throwing for barely over 200 yards a game, Uh, He's completing 70% of his passes over the last three games combined. And Notre Dame is going to have to run the football. And Riley Leonard is going to have to be efficient because I am watching this football game because all eyes are going to be on there. Next game up, Boise State at UNLV. Lord have mercy. Now, this on its face, if you just say Boise State at UNLV, you wouldn't think that this is a huge game. But this game could be for a trip to the college football playoff. And not even just that. Boise is ranked so high right now that depending on what happens in the Big 12 or the ACC or even uh, not really so much the Big 10 or the SEC, you could end up having Boise State having a top four seed, which is wild. Everybody is asking if UNLV can stop Boise State running back phenom asked the Jinty that's averaging almost 10 yards a carry. Now, that's the wrong question that people need to be asking, and that's for two reasons. First, the answer is no. They're not going to be able to stop him. If Oregon couldn't do it, the running Rebels won't be the first people to do it this season. Not on fresh legs and two weeks rest, no. And uh, an opportunity to scheme, too? Yeah, no. The real question is, is, does anybody have an answer for this UNLV go-go offense? in Brennan Marion that he's running because you don't have to stop Boise State's offense if you can hang with them and go punch for punch scoring because UNLV has averaged 46 points per game since Hodge Malik Williams took over at quarterback for Matthew Sluka. I'm just saying, and this is not to slight Matthew Sluka, who was 100% justified in leaving UNLV. But the team has rallied around the Campbell transfer at quarterback who stayed and proved he could steer this ship and even be more dynamic and efficient than Sluka was. Now, the best part about this game is that the fact that a spot in the college football playoff is on the line. 
UNLV also has that opportunity because by winning this game or any of the games left on their schedule to have its first back-to-back winning season in 40 years, that's a big deal. And beating Boise State can make anybody's season at this point. So they have to be careful not to slip up with this target on their back. But the only team I see left on Boise State's schedule that can match the Broncos blow for blow is this UNLV team. So I can't wait to see how this game shakes out because it is highly important. But I think I want to see Ash and Jinty on that Heisman stage. So I'm going to pick Boise State to win. People called me crazy for saying that Quinn Ewers was going to have a short leash at quarterback. Where y'all people at? Oh, but I haven't heard much from y'all people after y'all watched the undefeated number one team pull Quinn Ewers to see if Arch Manning could give the team a spark while Georgia had the Longhorns in an absolute chokehold. So how does Texas respond after losing to Georgia and being dominated last week? Now we'll find out against a Goliath killer Diego Pavia and Vanderbilt because they have already got a win over Alabama this year and they are not going to be intimidated by the ranking anybody brings into the building. They are not at all. Now, Texas fans already had to deal with the false report of Quinn Ewers quitting the team, which was no truth to it. And it'll be interesting to see how much that they stand by Ewers if Texas doesn't get off to a fast start this week. Now, the key for Texas here, is going to be neutralizing Vanderbilt's tight end, Eli Stowers, who has hauled in over 30% of Diego Pavia's completed passes this season. If Texas is able to slow down Stowers, Pavia, he's going to have to scramble around even more than he already does. And there's a chance that the kid tires himself out for the end of the game. Now, on the offensive side, Texas has to get back to running the football because Georgia shut down that aspect of the Texas offense that had been dominant this year. And while Quinn Ewers is good, nobody, no quarterback in college football is good enough to beat Georgia without being able to run the football. I'm going to take Texas in this ball game. That's the Unafraid Show. Make sure that you like, subscribe, get notifications, and tell your friends about the Unafraid Show. And of course, leave a comment and a like, thumbs up.